I lecture uh, GI pathology to second year veterinary students and um, I go around the room and I said, rather than me talk about it, I want each one of you, you know, tell me what indicates to you that an animal has gastrointestinal disease. And you might imagine the ones that you get most often are diarrhea, um, weight loss. Um, if you're dealing with dogs, you know, dogs and cats, you know, vomiting and maybe some blood in the, uh, blood in the feces, regurgitation. But things we want them to think about on a production level, there may be some very subtle things that are affecting production that may be related to the GI tract. Um, decreased weight gain, decreased milk production, decreased egg production if you raise breeders, um, uh, perhaps problems with semen production in the, in the males. So there's a wide variety of things that may draw you in to looking for gastrointestinal disease. And that's, as I'd mentioned at necropsy session yesterday, that's why when I get a history, it's always nice to have a history of what, that, what the condition of that flock is, how many birds have died, what you've treated with. But when you're actually posting these birds, you're really doing a thorough workup trying to examine every system because it's very easy to miss something if you don't consider the entire picture and, and uh, uh, try to put the pieces together. I can use this. So what is the digestive system? It's a pretty impressive structure when you think about it. We have these whole feed materials, and we're going to put it into this muscular tube that courses through the animal's body, our own body, for example. And it's our body's job to break those down into smaller particulate matter. Then they have to take that particulate matter and break it down into nutrients. And then it has to break down those nutrients into the building blocks, such as amino acids and the carbohydrates and the fatty acids. And then it has to absorb them into the bloodstream so that they can go where they need to go. So what's remarkable about that is the digestive process, particularly in birds, can occur in a matter of hours before that material is passed right through is uh, what, well, what's not used is manure. So it's a remarkably efficient process. However, we can always do our best to mess it up under certain circumstances, whether it's through management or exposure to infectious diseases or, or whatever. This is a table from your notes, and just to demonstrate that um, very specialized segments of the intestine are specialized for a reason. They, they differ in how they look uh, morphologically. They differ in the pH. The pH is very important for the um, enzymatic digestion. Enzymes are active at different pHs, so the enzymes that are secreted, for example, into the proventriculus, pepsin and lipase are going to be active at that acid pH. There are also other lipases, for example, in the duodenum that are active at a pH of 6. Also, when you have a pH of 2.5, there has to be a different structure or protective mechanism in that portion of the GI tract to protect the epithelial cells that line that segment. Dr. Watkins yesterday, I, I, I got this idea when Dr. Watkins was talking about the, um, the bacterial slime layer in those, in those uh, water lines. Because she was talking about how bad those are and how you need to get rid of them. And it made me think about the mucus slime layer that's in the intestine and how we want to keep that. And it is very important. Um, the mucus that is produced by the GI tract. In fact, I was just talking to a gentleman in the back about mucus being produced in the crop. That is something that we want the body to do. It provides a very important lubrication and protective function for the mucous membranes of the GI tract. They contain normal bacterial flora. And in addition, there are antibodies that are secreted into the GI tract, which lodge in that mucus. And they can provide a protective function for various toxins or bacteria or viruses that get in there. So this mucus that lines the intestine is extremely important, and it protects that epithelium. Now, if you want to mess that up, how about dehydrating the birds, leaving the birds off water for several hours? That's going to diminish your mucus layer. Um, forget to feed them for 12 hours. When they're feed, experimentally, if we want to produce salmonella or campylobacter infections in a variety of animals, you know how we do it? We take them off feed. 
for about um, 12 to 24 hours. And that depletes the protective mucus layer in the intestine. And it's a lot easier to infect that, those birds, those birds or whatever animal we're talking about. Same phenomenon can occur in your flocks if there's a problem with the water lines or inadequate feeding or something like that. Um, of course, we can mess up the whole system if we have an overload of, of bacteria and viruses they're exposed to, and if some type of stress. I know we hate the term stress because it's so hard to define, but it certainly has been demonstrated that stress can impair the immune system, the, the ability of uh, our immune cells, the lymphocytes, to produce antibodies uh, for protection. So all these things can mess up that mucus layer. The beak. First part of the alimentary tract. Probably kind of boring in our galliforms. I think it gets more interesting when you start getting into these, into these other species. Fairly uniform since they're primarily uh, uh, grain-eating birds. But you have some birds that are sifting their beaks through the water to sort out uh, uh, plankton or, or um, uh, small microorganisms. Some birds have beaks that are for pecking and piercing material. And I think you see a few of these around the McFarland uh, uh, pheasant uh, Pens, I would imagine at certain times of the year, the red-tailed hawk, which has a beak for, for uh, tearing. In fact, probably a few of you have seen these birds around your pens from time to time. I'm sure they look at those pens like it's a smorgasbord. The oral cavity, and again, I showed this to quite a few people yesterday. Um, one interesting thing about the upper palate, this is the upper beak right here, the palate. Um, there's a slit in that palate. That's a coanal slit. And uh, it's just a connection between the nasal cavity and the oral cavity. And on either side of that, you've got these little um, papillae, very sharp-ended structures. And there's several of those on the tongue as well. And the reason I show you that is those are just structures that help to draw the feed into the, down into the pharynx. You know, the bird has to have some way of grasping the feed and drawing it in. So let's start with the upper part of the digestive tract and um, the tongue. As I mentioned, it has some, usually has some sharp prongs on it that help grasp the feed. And from the tongue are the pharynx, the esophagus, the crop, which is a dilation, a diverticulum of the esophagus. And it will continue down here to the proventriculus, but we're going to concentrate on this portion. And these produce a lot of mucus, lubricates those structures, those feed particles so they can get down into the GI tract. And it, the feed moves down by peristaltic contractions. This is essentially a tube made of smooth muscle, and it just rhythmically contracts. And really, a good example is when you're squeezing the toothpaste out of your toothpaste tube in terms of how that, how that motion works. And it's extremely important for moving that feed down. Sometimes that becomes impaired in a, in a variety of species, and if, if that peristaltic movement isn't there, you're going to deal with maldigestion and, and, and poor condition. Um, a nice feature of birds, particularly the galliforms, is that they can feed a large amount at one time because they can store that feed in the crop. And then they can, they can go elsewhere and perch, and the digestion can take place after they've had that one-time feeding. I think I have a photo of the crop opened up here. Yep. If you open up the crop, there's a lot of mucus on the lining. It usually has a grayish pink appearance, sometimes yellow. That's what I would call normal right there. Um, I'm showing you this because of capillaria worms. Got a lot of questions about capillaria. This is a chucker with capillaria. And the crop wall, you just have to take my word for it here, is thickened. I think the thing that stands out, it's fairly blood red, and all these white areas here, some of these are the worms that are hanging off. And this is what the eggs look like. So there's a variety of ways to get a diagnosis on capillaria. This is an obvious case of capillaria. Sometimes you've got to go take the crop and get some, have it looked at microscopically to make that diagnosis. So from the crop, the feed passes to the proventriculus and the gizzard. And usually those are intimately associated with the liver on one side. The feed's going this way from the proventriculus to the gizzard. Now in the proventriculus, that's the secretory stomach, which is most similar to our own stomach. It secretes hydrochloric acid, has a pH of between uh, 2.5 and 3. 
and also produces pepsin, which is active at that acid pH. Pepsin degrades um, protein uh, peptide segments. And from the proventriculus, the feed passes into the gizzard. And the gizzard really is a remarkable structure. It's just two layers of smooth muscle that go in opposite directions. It's almost taking your hands and clasping them together. And particularly the gizzard of turkeys, you can take a, a variety of fairly large, thick-shelled nuts, and uh, the, the, the gizzard will just pulverize those in a very short amount of time because their job truly is to crush whatever goes into that, whether it's cracked corn or small pieces of gravel or something like that. Larger pieces of stone tend to lodge in the gizzard, and they may wear down over time. But of course, birds tend to accumulate those in the gizzard because those also aid the digestive function or the, the crushing function in the gizzard. It's, I know it's been demonstrated in studies that birds really don't need to have those stones in their gizzards, it doesn't enhance the digestion process compared to control birds that don't have access to grit. But um, you always find, it's, it's a standard to administer that to the bird and you usually find it lodged in this area. Now because of that crushing that takes place, that gizzard wall has got to be protected on the inside. So what it has created, it's created a wall of a callus and my analogy yesterday was talking about how when you have a callus on your hands or on your feet, you get that real thick layer of, of skin. And so what takes place in the lining, this is called, uh, it's called coilin, K-O-I-L-I-N, but it's a very thick protein layer. And it provides, um, again, it's easily as thick as, as the callus that you're familiar with, and it provides great protection for the epithelium that produces excuse me, produces that material. And when you think about it, the fluid that's coming to the gizzard comes right from the proventriculus, and so it's acidic. So that also helps protect the lining of the gizzard from the acid that's going to reach it. Litter eaters, probably the one thing that stands out with me, doesn't matter if it's a, a you know, pheasant chick or a chucker or a, a turkey pulled or broiler, that um, has some type of gastrointestinal disease, they tend to sit around and eat litter. Um, and I, we also refer to that as pica. And it's like a, a demonstration of the bird demonstrating to us that, 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 it's, that it's uncomfortable. And um, probably the other time, the other types of birds that I see litter eating, uh, the litter accumulating in the gizzard is when the bird's lame because it's just not competing with the other birds and getting to the feeder. So I've been wrong before. I've seen some birds with respiratory disease that have this too. But if I'm necropsying birds and I start to see a lot of litter in the gizzards of these birds, I'm starting to think that I really need to pay close attention to the GI tract of these birds. I drive the students crazy with this. Why did the chicken cross the road? Well, Bill Gates says our soon-to-be-released chicken 2012 will not only cross the road, it will lay eggs, file your important documents, organize photos and MP3 audio, and offer wireless capability. Small intestine. This is the portion, in my opinion, the portion of the GI tract that does most of the work. Most of the enzyme, you know, 95% of the enzymatic digestion and absorption that takes place in the intestine, uh, that takes place in the body, takes place in the small intestine. And it occurs in three segments, the duodenum, which is the upper portion, the mid portion, which is the jejunum, and then the final portion, which is in the ileum. So if you're talking about the things we're really concerned about these birds doing, absorption of the nutrients, making sure that they're absorbing their calcium and phosphorus for bone and egg production, it's the small intestine that we're, that we're primarily concerned. And I'll, we'll take, take you through each segment here. There's a disease in broilers, sometimes in turkeys, called ulcerative enteritis. It's a clostridial infection. And so I wanted to show you an abnormal just to give you an idea of what normal look like. If some of you who saw the intestine yesterday that we opened up, usually a smooth, glistening surface. It's got a little fluid layer. You know, there's mucus on the surface, but that's what you like to see. Here in this, this broiler with the clostridial infection, there's just marked inflammation and destruction of that lining of the intestine. 
So if, even if you don't know much about the, the pathology of the GI tract or what goes wrong, you can look at an intestine lining like that and say that's just, that is not compatible with the life of the bird. There is going to be no absorption of nutrients occurring in that, in that animal. In a normal bird, what we expect to see in the intestine are these fronds of epithelial cells. They're fingers, they're, they're villi. And they're thrown into folds because it greatly increases the absorptive capacity of, of that intestinal tract. The more of those fingers you have or villi, the more surface area there is for absorption. So anything that affects that, the integrity of that epithelium is going to affect the absorption from that intestine. So for example, two years ago I gave a talk on rotavirus in pheasants at this meeting and um, I'm certainly not an artist but I drew this picture to get the, get the point across of, of what the rotavirus can do. These are the villi that I had just shown you and those villi are covered with enterocytes or epithelial cells of the intestine and the rotavirus enters and multiplies in the mature cells that are on the tips of those villi, and it destroys them. It destroys them while it's making more virus. So you destroy this epithelium right here, and it causes blunting, causes those villi to shrink down, and that's what you get here, this rough, ragged appearance. So when you start to shorten those villi, you're reducing the absorptive surface, and you also are promoting, creating an environment where other organisms can start growing as well. Recently, I had a case come in, um, just talked to a fellow on the phone, and he sent in some chuckers. He said, well, I'm having foot problems with these chuckers. And, well, yeah, you're having foot problems, but there's a reason you're having foot problems. So, so we had to talk about, one, it was mostly manure on the feet of these birds. So, you know, either you've got a drainage problem in your pen in terms of uh, the, the reason that you've got a, a slick area in your, uh, actually in your barn, um, or you've got a diarrhea problem in these birds. So it was very easy to examine these birds. I don't have a photograph of it and find out that there was also fecal pasting around the feathers of the vent and on the upper upper legs, that type of thing. So again, if I had just if he had just told me he had a foot problem and I told him, well just send me in the legs from these birds, I would not have been able to make my diagnosis. So you kind of consider the whole picture in these birds. So in terms of diarrhea, the, uh, my 32nd lecture on diarrhea, and that's the one we most uh, notice most often when these birds are ill, if there is a GI problem. Essentially, you have fluid in the intestine, and that fluid has to be absorbed. And if it's not going to be absorbed, it's going to come out with the manure. So if you have reduced absorption, a fluid in the intestine, that's going to contribute to diarrhea. There are some abnormalities, abnormalities of the intestine where the, the system secretes more fluid into the intestine. Um, e. coli infections in a variety of animals, pigs, calves, etc., they cause hypersecretion of fluid and that promotes diarrhea. So you can have re either have decreased absorption of the fluid that's already in there or secretion of more fluid into the lumen. Maldigestion, um, we don't describe this as much in birds as we do in, um, in uh, other domestic animals. If there's deficiency of enzymes being produced by the pancreas, for example, there, the enzymes are not there to degrade the nutrients into the building blocks, such as the amino acids and carbohydrates. So those unabsorbed nutrients just stay in the intestine and they draw more fluid out into the lumen and, and you, have, uh, you, you can see diarrhea with that. Gut hypermotility probably is the last on the list, but um, in some disorders, for example, um, in animals that are, um, that are frightened, there can be um, increased production of, of um, increased stimulation of the parasympathomimetic system. It's a, it's a set of nerves that in, in, innervate the uh, GI tract, and that can cause it to uh, contract more rapidly. And with that rapid contraction, the feed can move down the GI tract faster. And with inadequate digestion, you're going to have more fluid that's in, the, uh, that's in the manure as well. So there's a variety of things that can cause diarrhea. They're not all uh, caused by infectious diseases. The pancreas. The pancreas certainly are part of the GI tract. 
Um, they have an endocrine function just like our pancreas. They produce insulin for glucose metabolism, but they also have an exocrine function. They produce enzymes that are then excreted into the lumen of the intestinal tract, amylase and lipase. Amylase for, for carbohydrate degradation and lipase for fat degradation. And I have never necropsied uh, any bird of any type that does not have a duodenum in a loop with the pancreas right in the center. That's something that I have seen in virtually every bird that I've ever necropsied, and it's immediately off the gizzard. So there's the pancreas right in the center. I think there's a photo in your notes as well. The ileum. The ileum is the last part of the intestine. And before I forget, I kept on mentioning Meckel's diverticulum to everybody. And I was going to show you the Meckel's diverticulum uh, on the intestine of some of those pheasants. And I, I couldn't find it, probably because it was so small. But in this little square here, there's just a little nub of tissue. And that's the yolk stalk. That's where it's, it's in the jejunum. Actually, it's in the jejunum. That's where the yolk stalk was originally attached, attached to the intestine of that bird. Of course, the yolk sac being the, uh, the, the, the nutrient sac that kept that chick alive for the first three days, three to four days after hatch. The ileum doesn't do that much. It absorbs, does some fluid absorption. Um, it's the last part of intestine. By the time the feed is passed from the jejunum down to the ileum, most of the digestion and absorption has taken place. At this point, the ileum's going to be used for, uh, primarily for fluid absorption water. Now let's go to the hindgut. This is where we get to the, to the cica of the bird. The, there's paired cica on either side. This is characteristic of all the birds that, I, that do the work for us, our turkeys, broilers, uh, peafowl, uh, our other game birds. Um, very large. And I'd mentioned yesterday in lab, I wouldn't open them up because there's a lot of bacterial growth and fermentation that normally takes place in there. And it truly is just a foul smelling uh, uh, organ, the material that's produced inside. And the birds empty that two or three times a day. You'll see different distinct droppings that compared to the manure that they'll, that they'll produce, um, shoot, two or three times an hour under some circumstances. Uh, mostly water absorption occurs in the cica, uh, much, much more than any documented absorption of amino acids or carbohydrates. As a pathologist, I love the cecum because it's very helpful for disease diagnosis. And um, again, I used the word uh, phrase as uh, talked about coccidiosis and salmonella quite a bit in lab yesterday, and I'll show you some, some photos of that as well. Those are, and also blackhead. Um, histomoniasis. There are distinct lesions in the cecum which are very useful for, uh, for the veterinarian who's, uh, who's uh, working up that flock. Chucker partridges with coccidiosis. One of the, the hallmark lesions we see in these birds with this strain of coccidia is this white inflammatory material. This is the cecum opened up here. And again, I use, was using the terms talking about cheesy cores or, or hard white core chalky material. And, and this is all inflammatory material. And if you scrape that, you see all these oocysts, which are the, the quote unquote eggs of the, uh, of the uh, uh, coccidial parasite. As you can see by this marker, these birds are very, very young at this point. They're probably about uh, a week and a half to two weeks of age. The colon. The colon is fairly short. It's the last part of the tract. Mostly water absorption takes place here. Um, of course, it will store the manure for a period of time before it's evacuated. The cloaca. This is the region immediately next to the vent of the bird, and it's a storage chamber that has three different body systems entering into it. And this is actually a broiler chicken I did the other day with a very extremely, this is the bursa of Fabricius right here, which is the B cell organ of the bird. This is actually a very poor bursa. Um, I was grading bursas on these birds. Um, so this is an immune organ right here, and it empties into a structure called the proctodium. So there's three chambers in the, in the cloaca, the proctodium right here, the uridium, which is right here, 
or excuse me, I'm sorry, proctodium, uridium, and copridium. In the uridium, that's the region of the cloaca where the urates from the kidney come in, the nitrogenous waste products, and also the, um, the egg will pass through. So it's a, it's a one chamber, it's a one stop shopping, I would say, where you have manure, eggs, urates, um, all at the same time. And of course, the copridium is the area where the fecal material will come from the colon into the, uh, the cloaca. The liver, certainly a very part, important part of the digestive tract, cause, primarily because it produces bile for, uh, for, t that's used for fat digestion. This is a, um, I forget what, pheasant, pheasant chick, this is the liver. Two lobes on either side, the heart right there. Uh, I'm just showing you this because we'll often see in chicks that have not uh, accessed the feed early enough or have some GI disease and aren't, aren't eating, they become the starve out. So if we opened the gizzard right here, we'd probably find litter in the gizzard. And the gallbladder is enlarged in this bird, which means that it has, this chick has not been eating. Um, the bile is stimulated to be emptied into the intestine when the feed passes down. If there's no feed passing down, that bile just sits in the gallbladder and it enlarges. So when I open chicks and I see this, that's an immediate indication that these birds have not been eating. What does the liver do? Well, again, I think a whole week could be dedicated to talking about that. So I'll just mention in 30 seconds that um, uh, it's a metabolically active organ. It, it metabolizes all the proteins, carbohydrates, and fats uh, that we consume. It synthesizes and excretes bile, which is obviously very important for fat digestion. It produces, um, I think, about 40% of the coagulation factors, our blood clotting factors. Um, it also has a, plays a very important role. It sort of uh, polices the bloodstream. And I believe um, Steve Shaw was talking yesterday about macrophages and showing us EMs of the, of the macrophages and their function. There's macrophages in the liver that sort of play surveillance in the bloodstream. And if any um, uh, organisms that aren't supposed to be in the blood pass through, those macrophages will gobble them up and they reside in the liver. The other thing the liver does, it metabolizes toxins. Usually that's a good thing because if there's a, a toxic substance in the bloodstream, it can neutralize or inactivate that toxin. Sometimes there are enzyme systems in the liver cells that can take a toxin that's fairly inert and, or inactive and they can activate it and make it more toxic. So again, it depends on the type of toxin. And when that happens, um, that can cause uh, acute, acute liver damage. I think an example of that might be um, pyrolizidine alkaloids uh, in, in horses and cattle. And um, I think even some mycotoxins may experience that change as well. Why did the chicken cross the road? Well, Colonel Sanders with Kentucky Fried Chicken is worried that he missed one. So, several diseases I want to touch up on before I finish. Um, and these are just some minor things that I see the most. And the first, it's not the primary problem in the bird. It's usually related to the management of the bird. If I see birds that have a candida infection or crop mycosis, these are birds that you've had for a while that have been ill and you've been treating them for a week to 10 days or more with antibiotics, usually antibiotics in the drinking water. And what those antibiotics do, um, and that's generally why most of these antibiotics, they recommend you use them for four or five days, see how the birds are doing, and go on from there. Those antibiotics can actually change the ratio of the good bacteria that are, in the in, that are uh, inside the GI tract. And if you reduce the numbers of those good bacteria, you allow the other organisms that are in there to start to overgrow. So a, a, a fungus or a yeast organism such as Candida, it's ubiquitous. It's, a, it's in the environment. It's in our GI tracts. But if there's fewer, uh, uh, if there's less inhibition of the growth of that, uh, of that yeast, it will overgrow. And this is what it ends up looking like. Normal crop on this side, smooth, glistening surface, little mucus on there, and you got this lumpy, bumpy appearance. 
on the surface of this crop. And it's kind of a white pseudo membrane. We call it a Turkish towel appearance because it it's, looks, in classic textbooks they call it that because it kind of looks like there's a rug or a little towel laid over that crop. Um, and uh, when I see this, it's usually not what's killing the bird. It's just an indication of what the bird's been treated with. Um, however, in a very young bird, in a chick, if there's too much of this, that's going to interfere with digestion. So the candida itself may cause more problems than what you were originally treating the bird for. Um, you can treat it. You could, you could put some nystatin antifungal in the feed to treat. Some people, um, you know, I've never heard of this being used in, 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 in game birds, but in turkeys or broilers, um, copper sulfate uh, in solution in the drinking water for 24 hours. Or sometimes if you just take them off antibiotics, um, the birds often can, uh, can treat themselves and get their bacterial flora in their intestinal, in their GI tract back to normal. But again, we usually see that either in the throat, in the esophagus, or in the, the, the crop region. And this is just what, that's why it's causing problems because you have these, these lines of yeast that are growing into the wall of the, uh, of the crop. I already mentioned that. Salmonella. I promised somebody I'd shown some pictures of what salmonella, salmonella look like. So I'm going to talk about paratyphoid salmonella. We have the salmonella. People are all familiar with MPIP, and probably some of you may test, test your birds and such. National Poultry Improvement Plan. And that was originated back in the 30s to, um, to uh, prevent the occurrence of salmonella pylorum and, and salmonella gallinarum, which is a, a pylorum disease, and foul typhoid, a devastating, salmon, devastating salmonella infections of young chicks. The breeders can carry it. They don't show any clinical signs, but the chicks get it and they die. I've never dealt with any problems with pylorum disease in game birds. Uh, we just don't see it anymore because of the, uh, how effective the MPIP is. But I see a lot of salmonella in broilers and turkeys and, and game birds. There's 2,000 serotypes of salmonella, and easily over 200 of these have been identified in poultry. Um, this is just an example of some of those. And they can wipe out chicks very easily. Uh, they can cause enteritis inflammation of the, uh, uh, the intestine, inflammation of the cecum, which is tiflitis. Yolk sac infections can be very common with salmonella. Um, uh, and peritonitis, inflammation of the tissue within the abdominal cavity, can occur as well. Um, one of the hallmark lesions that I'll see in salmonella infections, and both of these are from, are from game birds, Again, we have the cecum here, paired cecum, right there. And you have this little core of firm colored material. Sometimes there's more blood in there, but again, those, that cheesy core material. So I probably said 10 times yesterday, I always check the cecum, and if I see that white or reddish firm material in there, I'm thinking either we have coccidiosis or we have salmonellosis, and we have to do some uh, further tests to determine that. So any of us can make that diagnosis. That's, we've just done the easy part. If we, can, if we uh, demonstrate to you that your chicks have uh, salmonella, the big question that arises after that, where did it come from? And that can be a challenge to put the parts of this puzzle together because there's a variety of sources. Depending on the husbandry of your, of your pens, um, it could be brought in by, by mice and other rodents. It could be... Um, an infection that's just habitually uh, uh, present in the house. Um, it could be spread in by feces of, of, of these wild animals that get into the house. Um, other birds, wild birds coming in could bring it, or you could have brought them in by birds that were already infected previously. Some forms of salmonella can be transmitted from the hen directly to the chick. Um, eggs can be contaminated with salmonella. Um, either before or at the hatchery. So there's a lot of different sources and testing that needs to take place to try to determine what the key source of that salmonella might be. That's not an easy thing to do, and to me that's where the, the, the greatest challenge is. This is where uh, some of your labs may be of most use to, me, to you, as well as your veterinarians who can work with you uh, to decide what areas might require the most testing uh, 
to uh, determine uh, the source, if at all possible. I added this disease as well because we uh, mentioned it yesterday. This is a disease of bobwhite quail, ulcerative enteritis, and this is a clostridial infection. And the hallmark lesions of ulcerative enteritis, well, you can guess, ulcers in the intestine, right? These little round ulcers. This is the bacteria are essentially eating through the wall of the intestine, and they're also colonizing the liver as well, these little white spots. So these start out as like about a millimeter or so in size, and they can, they can converge and get, and get larger. A lot of times you have these intestinal lesions without the liver lesions, but this is kind of what the, the hallmark of enteritis, ulcerative enteritis in these quail. Just looking at the intestine, once again, you have the ulcers, they're penetrating the wall. I took this and opened it up, and you can see how an intestine like that, either it's not compatible with life, or you can easily understand why the bird isn't absorbing the nutrients from the intestinal tract that it, that it, that it needs to. It's frustrating to diagnose ulcerative enteritis, and, and there may be um, there may be some uh, either some growers or veterinarians uh, better than me who know how to prevent this right off the bat. But usually, when someone calls me and they send in birds and they have a high mortality spike in their bobwhite quail, um, by the time I diagnose ulcerative enteritis in their birds, um, I tell them I tell them you can probably expect to lose. 50 to 60 percent of those birds. You're just going to have to accept it. And oftentimes, it's interesting, it's people who are raising birds for the first or second time who are just going to, I'm sure some of you have been, who are raising quail and been doing it for years, it happens occasionally, but it's quite a devastating disease in bobwhite quail. And um, you can recommend some antibiotic treatment, neomycin, bacitracin, they're both good gut antibiotics, LS50, um, lincomycin, spectinomycin combination in the, in the drinking water. The problem is when you have these birds that are dying like this, the last thing they want to do is walk around and drink and eat. And so I think, sometimes I think it's not the infection that's killing them as much as the fact that it's very difficult to even treat them and, and get the antibiotic into them. Um, the only other thing I can recommend, I'll encourage people to go in and just walk the houses or walk the pens a little more often just to stimulate some activity on the part of those birds. If you disrupt them, perhaps they'll look over and take a drink or, uh, or, or, or eat something to, to sustain themselves. Um, the clostridial organisms, they form spores, and you can have a fairly high spore buildup in certain environments. So if you're not raising your quail on wire, if you can rotate your pens from time to time, that would help reduce or at least replace the, uh, the soil in your pen with uh, a fair amount of uh, uh, sand to en enhance drainage. The last one, why did the chicken cross the road? I made the chicken disappear and reappear on the other side, David Copperfield, magician. So that's it.